Good morning, Three Crosses family. Are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Woo! So great seeing Buzz and Tara and Carla and friends around here this morning. So good to have everyone here. And isn't it great to come into church and smell pizza when you're coming in? I think that's awesome. Help out our student ministries get to camp this week uh, by buying some pizzas on your way out today. So good to have you. My name is Larry Vold. I serve as one of the pastors here at Three Crosses. And we're just so glad you're here. If it's your first time or your hundredth time, Praise God that you're here. Find your sermon outline or open your app, check in, let us know you're here, and meet me in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Now, you may have noticed for the past several weeks, the themes we've looked at here in the Sermon on the Mount are framed in this little but powerful phrase, don't do it. Now, that's because in these different sections of Scripture, Jesus is introducing topics with this little prelude, do not. Do not practice your righteousness to be seen by others, he says, chapter 6. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. When you fast, don't look somber, and so on. These are the do not, the don't do it section of the Sermon on the Mount. And today we come to a doozy of a don't do it statement. Are you ready for this? Matthew 7, verse 6. Meet me right there. Let's read it together. Just follow along. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. This is God's word. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you've ever been confused by a verse like that, or maybe that verse in particular, but I hope today that you'll understand what's going on here in this very powerful section of the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and there's no question about it, it's a confusing text. Um, it's not immediate clear, immediately clear what's going on here. It, it sounds like Jesus is saying that we shouldn't waste something on someone or an object that is somehow unworthy. That's what it seems to be saying. And there's maybe a little bit of hint of truth to that. But Jesus doesn't provide any detail as to what shouldn't be wasted or on whom. I mean, the closest we get to is the phrase sacred, or the little word sacred there. And then he mentions pearls. If your name is Margaret, the Greek word margarita comes from this word pearl. It's something of value. We've got to talk about dogs and pigs, too. So we got, we got a little bit of a mess to clean up here today. Um, this has led a lot of people in churches to be kind of confused about the text. In fact, the early church uh, thought that this was a prohibition against those who would be unbaptized taking communion. Let me just read from the Didache, which is a second century document that uh, the early church believed to be the teaching of the apostles. And it says in chapter 9 of the Didache, let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist, but only they who have been baptized into the name of the Lord. For concerning this also the Lord has said, give not that which is holy to the dogs. <laughs> sure, to remind the church that unbelievers should not take communion is probably good advice. But is that what Jesus had in mind when he said this in Matthew 7, verse 6? I actually don't think so. Uh, the other churches in centuries past, uh, because of Matthew 13, 45, that compares the gospel to a pearl of great price, and since Jewish people looked at the Gentile world as dogs, there were times where the churches believed that what Jesus was saying here is that the gospel should not go to the Gentiles, or in a more general sense, to unbelievers. But that doesn't make any sense at all. Because Jesus even told the church to go make disciples in every nation. And that we would be, oops, 
he would be, we would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So how could it be that? Well, I don't think it's all that difficult, actually. And the way the sermon's going to flow this morning, we're going to look at two things, actually one big thing that we need, that this verse, I think, is pointing us to. Jesus is giving us a scenario here to help us see this one thing that all of us need to make decisions in our lives, good decisions, big decisions, little decisions. Last week, you remember Pastor Austin shared with us about judgment, right? Verses one through five, this comes right out of it. It's like a a little bit of an explanation, I think, that Jesus is giving to verses one through five, where if you're going to make good judgment, you need this one thing. You need this one thing in the decisions you're gonna make today. You're gonna need this one thing in determining whether this sermon was good or not. The one thing that we need, and if it's your first note, first thing you can put down in your notes here today if you're taking notes, the one thing we need that this verse is telling us we need is discernment. Everybody say the word discernment. Discernment, discernment is an interesting thing. It's, it's not something that just comes automatically, but there is an intuition that comes with it. Let me just give you some definitions of discernment. A cognitive condition of someone who understands the mental ability to understand and discriminate, the trait of judging wisely or objectively, perception of what might otherwise seem obscure. This is all discernment. And I think, I'm gonna argue today, that Matthew 7, 6 is a verse all about the importance of discernment, and specifically discernment in two powerful areas in our lives. Two powerful areas. And the the first area is going to surround around this theme of the sacred and the pearls. And the second one is going to be surrounding around this idea of dogs and pigs. Okay, so it's it's kind of a simple outline, but follow along if you're able. Here's the first area of discernment that we need when it comes to uh, understanding what Jesus is saying here. If you want to write it down. We need to discern what's sacred and valuable so that we aren't foolish and treat these things like garbage. Uh, I know that that might sound a little strange, but as I was studying this passage, I came across an article by the late Ron Julian. He's an author and Bible scholar at Gutenberg College who makes an interesting connection between Matthew 7, 6 and Exodus twenty two thirty one. Now, just for the sake of time, we'll put Exodus twenty two thirty one up on the screen. Just follow along as I read it. God says through Moses to his people, you are to be my holy people. So do not eat the meat of an animal torn by wild beasts. Throw it to the dogs. And everybody said, amen. amen. <laughs> you say, Pastor Larry, you started with a, a difficult verse and things are not getting any better. I hear you, but just stay with me for a second. There were dietary laws in the Old Testament that set God's people apart from other nations, but also to protect them from illness and disease. Keep in mind that when Moses was giving this command in Exodus 22, there were no grocery stores, no Costco's, no smart and final, nothing. And so if you needed food, you either had to raise it or you had to hunt it. And there would be times where if you were really hungry and you came across an animal that had been torn to pieces by another animal, you would be tempted to look at that and go, you know, the back strap looks pretty good. (laughs) I think I'm taking that home. And God says, when you come across roadkill, don't do it. (laughs) Now let's keep in mind that this was not just about sanitary reasons. The sanitary purpose behind the dietary laws of the Old Testament were to remind the people of God that their lives should be characterized with that which is clean and holy. This is the whole purpose of the law of the Old Testament. And if you were a a New Testament Jewish person around the time of Christ, when he just said the statement, don't throw what is holy to dogs, you probably went to Exodus and thought about that sacred thing that might have been thrown out with the trash. If you have something that's valuable or sacred to you, you take care of it. 
You don't throw it out. You don't give it to the dogs. To give something to the dogs is to say, God is saying to us, look, I know, I know you need food. So you can eat the animals you raise. You can eat the animals you hunt. That meat is holy. It has an appropriate place in your life as my people. But when you find roadkill, you throw it to the dogs. Why? Because it's not good. It's not holy. What about holy meat? What about good meat? Well, we should see it as a gift that God gives to us to sustain our lives. And this is what Julian's point was in the article. Throwing what is holy and good to the dogs shows that we are fools for what God has called good and holy we have treated as garbage. Hmm. We should maybe stop right here and just think about what has Jesus been saying in this whole sermon about what's sacred? And you miss it if you're not careful. But if you go back, and this might be a little exercise for some of you that like to geek out a little bit more, but even more so from a practical standpoint, just go through the Sermon on the Mount and notate anywhere that you see something that is a treasure or something that you should value. The inner quality of your life versus religious externalism. Or being honest to God with the fact that you have nothing to bring to him, so we come in poverty of spirit. Or we become uh, people that mourn over our sin, or we live a life of meekness. The, these inner traits that Jesus says are kingdom traits, these are things that we apprise. These are things that we value. These are things that we hold on to. And what Jesus is telling us, perhaps, here in this passage, is that first and foremost, you've got to figure out what's really sacred. Matthew 7, 6 becomes at least in part a values assessment verse for us. And that begs the question of whether we look at the things that we value, are they really valuable? Are they really sacred? Are we holding on to the right things? And let's be honest. I will tell you right now that there have been so many times in my life where I've traded away that which was sacred for that which was common. We're all prone to switch the price tags on the things that God says is good and right. We flipped it around. And in fact, the church, the modern church, the American church, has a real problem with switching the values. Where God tells us that we should look at matters of the heart, we're so good at pretending as if we're walking with God when we're really not. We're no different really from the religious leaders in Jesus' day that walked around looking holy when holiness was nowhere in our lives. But don't, think, don't take that as a shame statement. See it this way, that Jesus wants us to hold on to that which is precious, that which is adoring, that which is truly life transformational. Because when we hold on to those things, that's when our lives really begin to change for the good. This is where transformation comes. I think the American church is way too full of its idols, its desire to, to, to uh, court with the, the politics of the day. And this isn't a message about politics, but it's a message that reminds us that whatever we're seeing precious that God says is common, we've flipped the price tags. And we need to change our ways. Don't throw what is sacred to dogs. Hmm. Well, that's, that's the first thing. Let me just say one more thing. I, I, the church in America really does need revival. And, and I, I don't think anyone here would disagree with that. But revival doesn't come from having great music and being people that are friendly and nice. Revival starts with confession and repentance of sin and recognizing that what is truly sacred needs to come back in our lives. And I don't know when at the last time you had a moment where you realized that Jesus is that sacred one. That what the church needs today more than anything is to once again install Jesus in his rightful place as Lord of the church. As someone that we would not trade away for anything because of how precious he is. And maybe our culture, maybe our society, 
would start respecting the church a little more if we'd get back to adoring the person of Jesus. And I just wonder, I just wonder if what our culture sees is a lot of people who call themselves Christians, and I'm putting myself in the same category where people just see us as Christians, but we're really living just like people in the world. And we don't have any treasure that we're holding on to. So take a minute, think about your life for a minute. I'm thinking about mine. I've been thinking about this all week, all month, recognizing that this is what Jesus was getting at. He says, am I your treasure? Am I? Am I your most beautiful treasure that you wouldn't trade for anything in the world because he's so precious to us. Well, we could stop right there and end the sermon, but there's another part of this passage that we need to look at. And this is the second area of discernment we need. If you're taking notes, we need to discern the level of engagement, our engagement among those who are indifferent to or oppose our message. Now, here's where we'll turn our attention, perhaps, to what is meant when Jesus mentions these dogs and pigs. <laughs> uh, for most of us, dogs and pigs represent pets, loving pets, or at least useful animals. Uh, I, personally, I'm a dog lover. Anybody else a dog lover here today? Anybody? Any cat lovers here? Doesn't matter. Anyway. <laughs> Our family, we grew up with a golden retriever, Murphy, greatest dog in the world. And then we got a, a Bernese mountain dog that was just the most 110-pound lap dog that just was so loving. And don't, they were such good old dogs. I love these dogs. I'm a dog lover at heart. And my grandparents raised pigs on their farm in Minnesota. And so when we would go back and visit, I used to love these little smelly creatures they were so cute, and when you picked them up, if you caught one, they would squeal like a pig, yes. And it was so cute, I loved it. That's the image I have when I see this thing about dogs and pigs. I think of Harley or Murphy, and I think of these little cute little pigs. But when Jesus used dogs and pigs in this text, he's not building a metaphor around domesticated animals. In that day, rarely did you have a pet. Dogs and pigs in Jesus' day were feral, vicious, mangy, cunning scavengers that roamed the countryside. And if you ran into one of these beasts, you were in trouble. And you knew it. And you would likely cast anything you had on you to distract them. And while they might just trample over it and tear you to pieces, that was your hope. This is the context of what Jesus is saying here. Now, this is where things can get really messy and out of whack in a hurry, so pay attention. What is Jesus using the metaphor of pigs and, and dogs to describe? He's simply saying that people act in ways sometimes consistent with vicious scavengers or predators when they encounter the gospel simply because they don't see its value or they become hostile to it. Now, Jesus may have intended this for his audience to see the dogs and pigs representing Gentile rulers because the Jewish people like to curry favor with the Gentile rulers when it seemed advantageous to do so. And probably the biggest example of that we see in the Gospels is when you know, Jesus is at the trial and they're wanting to give him over to Rome, right? To be crucified. And Rome actually pitches it back. Hey, we don't see any problem with this guy. Isn't he your king? And what do they cry out? We have no king but Caesar. This is the religious leaders of Jesus' day. We have no king but Caesar. You talk about giving dogs what is sacred? So Jesus went to the cross. Well, what happened after all that? A.D. 70, Rome destroys Jerusalem, raises the temple, almost as if verbatim the fulfillment of what Jesus says right here. Lest they trample it under feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So be very careful with who you're courting 
and what you're trying to do to earn some kind of favor. Whether it's politics or a person or something else that you think is going to help the church get you to where you need to be, Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, I'm the one who will get you where you need to be. Follow me. Now, if you look at the bigger context of this, uh, just a couple chapters over in Matthew, Matthew 10, verse 14, as Jesus sends his disciples out on mission, he says to them, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. Hmm, that sounds a little harsh. Now, in our sensibilities, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But in Jesus' time, in ancient Middle Eastern culture, hospitality was huge. And to not listen to somebody was being rude. It would be the same if you went to a house next door that had a problem and you were able to help them with that problem and you showed up at the door and the person opened the door and saw you and you're saying, hey, I'm here to help you with your problem and they go, wham, and they slam the door in your face. That's the kind of response that Jesus is talking about here when he says, when he tells his disciples that if someone won't welcome you or listen to your words. He's saying this kind of rudeness, this kind of rudeness is is not something that you need to subject yourself to, okay? Now, the the precarious nature of the gospel message is found in what Jesus says next to his disciples here in Matthew 10 as a final reminder when they go out. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves is the language of, guess what? Discernment. (laughs) It's recognizing that there are some environments, Jesus says, where you gotta be careful. Now, uh, opening up this context even a little wider still, beyond the Gospels, you go to the book of Acts, and did you know that there are three times in in the book of Acts where the apostle Paul when trying to bring the gospel to the Jewish people, say, that's it. You're not listening. You're not following. I'm going to the Gentiles. And chapter 13, chapter 18, and chapter 28, you can read all this. I just thought I would show you a little bit in chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. This is so interesting. It says, when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive to him, He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door where the entire household believed in the Lord. That's right in the scripture. And I found it interesting that sometimes getting out of environments that are sticky or abusive is literally just going next door. I remember taking our kids out once. I think I've even shared this story. They were young. We were passing out flyers in Castor Valley. Hey, just telling you about three crosses and what's going on. We come to one door and the guy just unloads on us. How dare you come to my house? Don't you see the sign? No solicitation. We're just there inviting people. Hey, we got some neat things going this summer. Just thought you would. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was so uncomfortable. And to this day, my kids remind me that was the worst experience they'd ever had taking the gospel out. And I remember in that moment, I didn't like it either. They said, Daddy, let's go home. I said, yeah, I want to go home too. But I thought, you know, let's not end. We went to the door right next door, and we had a completely different situation. Woman opens the door. She said, you wouldn't believe it. I was asking God if he's real today. I was asking this morning, God, if you're real, would you just bring someone to tell me so? There we are, standing at the door. I'm looking at my kids. See, it's better. It's actually better. (laughs) Sometimes it's just the next door. Or the next person. Now, I got to say two more things here because because there's a sense of urgency about the gospel that should always compel us to keep moving. There's There's an urgency with it. Don't get bogged down. And so two things I want you to see before we land the plane here. Number one, despite the possibility of indifference or hostility toward our message, We must engage regularly with people outside our faith in hoping to share the gospel with them. 
To me, this is the bigger issue that's hovering around Matthew 7, 6. Because most of us are not struggling with taking too many hits for sharing the gospel or wondering if we should, you know, shake the dust off our feet as protest to someone's indifference or hostility to us. That's usually not our problem. Usually our problem is we're just not sharing the gospel. (laughs) And beloved, I just want to remind us lovingly today That this is the top of our mission to take the gospel, to bring the gospel, to make disciples in our world. I have people ask me all the time, why are there so many people up at Three Crosses? How do you guys do it? Is it your programs? I just tell people, no, we just love the gospel. And when you share the gospel in love and you bring Jesus to, to, uh, to confront people with sin and a need for forgiveness of sin, people respond. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And so it's not programs, it's not fancy this or that, it's no individual people, it's just the gospel. And there's an urgency to it that keeps us moving. If you're visiting with us today, and you're going back to a church somewhere else, I hope that you're praying for that church and your pastor and the leaders of that church to have an urgency about the gospel. We shouldn't be calm, we just... The problem is that a lot of us, we're just so comfortable in the church. We just like hanging out with the church people. We like the music. We just, we just don't want to get that involved. That's not being a Christian. To be a Christian is to be on mission with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mission is to reach our world with the gospel. Thought I might get a little amen on that one, but that's okay. I'm going to forgive you. You're just so enthralled. You're on the edge of your seat right now. But this is, this is the reality. All right. Churches, churches need to stop playing church, and they need to get down to the business of the gospel. And, and, and we need to be good stewards of the resources we have, because here's, here's our, our problem. On one side, some of us we invite some, we, we just say, would you come to church with me? And they say, no, I'm busy. We say, oh, that was so terrible. I was rejected. It was awful. No, that was silly. They just said they couldn't come. But we take things so personally. And so then we never open our mouth, much less to bring someone to church, but to tell them about Jesus. As I've been praying all week, I say, Lord, would you put Jesus on our lips with our non-Christian friends and family and people in our neighborhoods this week? Would they hear the name Jesus in a way that might cause them to see that there's something good and beautiful and sacred about him in our lives? So that's one side. Then the other side is, some of us, we just keep pouring into people, talking to people, praying with people, the same people who could care less about this nonsense called the gospel. And we just keep giving it to them and running to their rescue and helping them all this. And Jesus says, look, You need discernment because sometimes it's better to move on because my gospel demands that kind of urgency. Hmm. All right. Which is the the second and last point here is that discernment is necessary to know when it's time to move on. Got to know. All right. I'm going to close the service with telling you three true stories that I think will help with the tension of what we talked about this morning. Story number one, a guy that was baptized here, his name was Mike, and I remember Mike saying something like, in his baptism, he said, you know, I said no to Jesus for a bunch of times, and people kept telling me about Jesus, and I kept shutting them down, and I would debate them and tell them to shut up, and I didn't want to hear about their Jesus, but deep down inside, I wanted them to keep going, and thankfully they did, and through perseverance and love, I came to see that I need a relationship with Jesus. And so here I am. I gave my life to Christ and he's getting baptized. It was a beautiful thing. And that stuck in my mind because sometimes when people say no, there's more going on under the surface than meets the eye. Story number two. There's a guy named Scott. I'd seen him a bunch at the gym out in San Ramon where I tend to go to. And, you know, just one of those things where it seemed like every time I was there, it didn't matter when I was there, He was there. And one day, I'd never talked to him before, but one day he saw my t-shirt. I was wearing a t-shirt that had a scripture verse on it. And he said it out loud from just a station away from where we were. And, And as he was reading it, I'm thinking, oh, Scott must be a believer. 
And so as I started walking to him, I could see he was not reading it with enthusiasm and joy. He was mocking it. And so I kind of de-escalated a little bit. I said, hey, I get it. You know, it's all right. Well, tell me about your life. And we started talking. And he, he was as anti-Christian as I could imagine. I mean, he was giving me every reason in the book why you have to be an idiot to believe you need to be saved. And if anybody needs saving, uh, they can save themselves, for goodness sakes. I mean, he just went on and on and on. And so for several weeks, I just tried to engage him. When I saw him, I tried to bring, you know, helpful argument to his debate. And, and he was just eagerly combative. <laughs> and one day it hit me. I need to move on. <laughs> So I decided, okay, Lord, obviously someone else is probably better fit to talk to this guy. I'm not going to talk to him anymore. I made that choice. I went to the gym. I'll never forget. He wasn't there. And I never saw him again. <laughs> Little disclaimer, that doesn't always happen to people I give over to the Lord that way. <laughs> like, I don't know. And then I thought, well, maybe he was an angel testing me. Or maybe he was a demon harassing me. Whoever he was, I never saw him again. Story number three. Paul was a high school kid, good ball player, basketball player, and his coach invited him to come play our pickup games, early morning basketball here at the gym. And so Paul came, and he was a really likable kid. We got to know each other. And he would always hear, like everyone else hears, a scripture verse in prayer before the games began. And we would play, and I remember a lot of times talking to Paul about Jesus, and Paul would say politely, hey, I'm not interested. I don't think I'm ever going to be interested. Basically, don't waste your time. But I love basketball, and so here I am. So we, we'd play basketball, have a good time, and then Paul disappeared. Didn't see him for a while. I think it might have been over a year. And then he comes back. Surprise, Paul had met Christ and given his life to Jesus. And so we laughed about how he had said no to Jesus so many times. Then, Paul felt a calling to go into the ministry. And he went to seminary and became a pastor. And I hadn't seen him for probably a couple of decades. And last summer, he got in touch with me and he said, hey, I'm on sabbatical and I'm going to be visiting the Bay Area and I would love to see you and I'd love to just see the church again. And so, could I come to service? I go, absolutely. So here's a picture of Paul and I sitting right there last summer when he was on sabbatical, and he's a, a lover of Jesus. He's bringing his family to the Lord. He's, he's a, a pastor in the local church. And isn't God amazing? Now, I've got, I got so many stories, but those three stories, I hope just encourage you with this tension that we live in. Not throwing your pearls to swine and keeping what is sacred to your heart. All right, here, here are the takeaways quickly. Uh, first of all, you need to determine your kingdom values. That's your assignment. What's precious to you? Augustine's age-old question, you can't know someone by asking them what they believe. You can only know someone by asking them what they love. What do you love? That's the first thing. Second thing, Align your ministry efforts with the discernment principle of Jesus. Is there somebody you need to kind of cut loose? I don't mean reject them. I don't mean stop praying for them. But just stop trying so hard because they're not picking up what you're laying down right now. Or is there someone that you need to bring the gospel to because you've just been negligent? Follow Jesus' principle of discernment. And then lastly... If you're one of those people that's been saying no to Jesus for too long, why don't you say yes today? He will not leave you or forsake you. And don't forget, he persevered an ugly death and rose victoriously to life to give you eternal life. Now, this morning... I'm going to pray, and as I pray, our worship team is going to come out. This is a time where we receive our offering. This is a time of worship, and we bring our gifts. If you're a guest, let these plates go by, but if this is part of your worship, would you bring your gifts to the Lord? And can I just ask you, please, politely, 
to not stand during this time until the worship team invites us to do so. Uh, it just helps with our ushers and what hap happens during this time. So just stay seated and we'll be invited to stand. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Jesus, thank you for your word. You are our treasure. We love you, Lord. And help people around us to see that's true. And if someone today you're drawing to yourself, give them the faith to believe and become a follower of you, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.